Welcome back to Oliver Scholar CEO Salon Series with your host, Dr. Danielle R. Moss. Tonight, in honor of Women's History Month, we will dig deep on the role of women of color in our past, present, and future. Tonight's panel will feature special guests, Deborah Martin Owens, Rose Pierre Louise, and Tanya Ramos. It's the reckoning. Let's talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Oliver Scholar CEO Salon Series. It's Women's History Month, y'all. So we have an amazing panel of really powerful, high-impact women who have navigated incredible careers, and we want to learn from them and lean into their wisdom tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. First, I'd like to introduce, um, and I'm not going to do long introductions because I'm going to ask the ladies to take some time and tell us a little bit about their journeys. So I met our first guest, Rose Pierre-Louis, when she was commissioner of the Office to Combat Domestic Violence for New York City. Um, she's currently with the NYU McSilver Institute. She has a long career in advancing women's leadership, women's issues, um, and I'm just so thrilled that she said yes about today's conversation. So Rose, welcome. Hi, Danielle. So good to see you and happy Women's History Month, everyone. It's so good to see you. To see Our you well. next guest um, is Deborah Martin Owens, who is um, a regional director of diversity at Sidley Law Firm. Like Rose, Deborah has been uh, a warrior in the civil rights, civil justice, uh, streets for a long time. She's also an attorney, and I'm looking forward to the conversation with Deborah. Thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you to all of the scholars for having me today. And happy Women's Heritage Month! Woohoo! <laughs> we got a month. I feel like we we got double the the love, right? We, Black History Month was last month, and bam, right, right here we are as women. Um, our third guest, and I'm not sure if, she, I know she was having some technical issues. Oh, Tanya Ramos Puig, who is the outgoing CEO of Pencils of Promise. Tanya and I have been uh, friends and colleagues in these uh, social justice streets for a very long time. She is a powerful Latina advocate for her community, and I'm so thrilled you were able to join us, Tanya. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I am so thrilled to be here. It is such a pleasure. And Danielle, yes, we've been on the social justice streets for many, many, many years. And I'm just thrilled to be here tonight. Forgive me, everyone have a bit of technical difficulty, but I am thrilled to be able to join the conversation. Happy Women's Month. Yes. So um, before we get started with the meat and potatoes of the conversation, um, I'm going to ask each of you to take a little bit and tell me, how did you get to where you are? What's your tra professional trajectory um, been like? And how have you navigated um, the spaces that you've been able to occupy? Rose is someone who held, um, you know, was actually, I think, the first Black woman uh, deputy borough president in, of Manhattan. Did I get that right? Haitian American, first Haitian, first Haitian American, American. and uh, deputy borough president and first Haitian American commissioner. Woohoo! So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah. Where did you go to school? How did you decide yeah. to go to law school? All that good stuff. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, and great to be here uh, with Zebra and Tanya and Danielle and everyone um, who's joining us today. Um, so. Um, when I was growing up, was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and yes, there are Haitians in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm first generation Haitian American. Um, growing up, um, I was always performing and um, I really thought I was gonna be the next Diana Ross. And um, uh, I'm a classically trained opera singer. Uh, later on in life, um, there was a side of me that was always deeply passionate about communities. And I think my first organizing event was at the age of eight. Um, so uh, I thank my parents for indulging me in my passion for opera and the arts. 
by like good West Indian parents. They were still trying to push me towards getting an education. Deborah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so um, continued in the arts, um, but also developed a strong interest in, in politics and um, in, in government. And uh, while kids, when I was like 11 years old, were out playing in the street in the summer, I was like watching the McLaughlin group and still remain like a, if people remember what the McLaughlin group is, um, I continued um, to, to be deeply passionate about politics, went to Tufts University uh, with the intent of pursuing a um, dual degree in music and poli sci, two of my passions, and very early on decided that I really wanted to pursue the political science with the interest of becoming a lawyer. My career has been squarely focused in working in the public se sector and particularly uh, in support of advancing the rights of women and girls. And uh, through that, I was a public interest lawyer for 17 years, representing survivors of domestic violence in courts throughout New York State. Then after that, surprise, surprise, a man named Scott Stringer becomes um, borough president and uh, was not thinking about going into government and uh, was encouraged to apply by one of my mentors. And I did so, and after a long appointment process, became the deputy borough president of Manhattan, first Haitian American, served two terms, dealing with a whole bunch of exciting issues, and um, thereafter uh, was appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio to, um, to uh, become commissioner and thereafter at McSilver. So I feel that the work that I do now combines my, my skill sets as an advocate, as an attorney, as a policymaker, and an organizer. And that's why working at McSilver is so exciting because I get to use all of those muscles each and every day. Thank you. So first of all, girl, I like the way she slid in the classically trained opera. I was like, <laughs> well, I've been knowing you for how long and I didn't know about that. I, know. I don't I don't talk about it a lot. Um, um, but I, I remember going to the 100th anniversary of um, birthday celebration for Marian Anderson. Wow. And I remember one of the it was black women came out, hair pulled back, beautiful red dress, beautiful red lip. And I looked at my parents and I said, I want to be that. So I, I still cry when I watch singing shows and I think, could that have been me? But I'm very happy with the journey where it's taking me and um, that I can continue to be someone um, that is lending their voice um, to causes that are critically important to women um, and to girls and certainly to um, communities of color. Deborah, can you share a little bit about your educational and professional journey? I think coming after Rose, I'm like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Um, so I'm actually a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in Queens. I still live in Queens. Um, I attended um, high school in Queens. I went to college upstate at SUNY Albany. And then I worked a little bit and went to Hofstra Law School. I'm the first in my family to graduate from high school. So my particular um, experience has been quite interesting because when you think of first gen, people are like first gen college. I'm like, well, I got first gen high school. Um, so definitely have uh, broken a lot of barriers in my family. Um, so I came out of Hofstra Law School and I started to um, work. I was at, a, at the unified court system, which is like our court system as a court attorney. And then I went over to a law firm for about 12 years as a staff attorney. And during that time, um, I was like really excited. I was like, finally, I got this law degree. I'm going to you know, be able to pay my bills on time and have food on the table. Like all the things you think about when you finally um, get yourself settled. But I would say many years into the role, I was like, I really care about like people. I care about like how lawyers are doing in their careers. I want to focus on empowering people, people of color and women. And I had been thinking a long time about how to transition. And I really wasn't sure. 
Um, so I started talking to people and I would say this anytime you're like confused about your career, confused about anything, it's good to have a community of friends that you can talk to and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. I joined organizations. I'm a, I'm a member of every organization you could think of. So I joined organizations and about 12 years in, I got a role at the New York City Bar Association where I became head of diversity for 24,000 lawyers um, and law students. And there I really like soared. It was everything that I wanted it to be in terms of helping lawyers and helping law students and kind of figuring things out, things that, and, and sharing some of my uh, journey and perspective with students that looked like me or, or, or if they didn't look like me, had the same journey as me being the first in their family. And then from there, um, I recently got um, plucked uh, to go to Sidley Austin as the East Coast Diversity Director, where I have um, assisting uh, three offices in New York, Boston, and DC on their diversity inclusion efforts, which is um, quite a few lawyers. I would say mm, about a good, you know, a thousand lawyers that I work with. Um, so it's really um, exciting. And I'll say I'm really happy about the fact that I get to to work with all of these lawyers and be able to empower them in their career. It is a dream job for me. And I'm just looking forward to seeing what's next in terms of how I can help this profession grow. As you know, the legal profession, like most of the professions out here, um, you know, just don't have the people that look like this on the screen. So it's really important that I get to say, you know, you can be a lawyer and you can thrive in this career as a lawyer. I also spend a lot of my time as a board, a nonprofit leader. So I've been on the boards of not only bar associations, but also nonprofit organizations, direct services, including Friends of Island Academy in Harlem. Shout out to Friends. And I'm currently the board chair of Women Creating Change. It's a 106 year old organization empowering women in civic engagement. So really excited about that work. I am um, the second person of color to be the board chair. And that is saying a lot, if you know a lot about being on boards. So I'll, I'll say that, but I hope that's good, Danielle, because I can talk forever about, you know, just how I started my little career. <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. And Tanya, tell us, how did you get to be leading international organizations? Tell me about your journey. Yes, yes. So let me begin by also saying that I'm a New York native, born and raised. I now live in New Jersey, but um, spent the great majority of my upbringing in Washington Heights. So anyone from Washington Heights, yeah, the Heights movie is coming out. Um, I also spent a lot of time in the Bronx. And like, like, um, like many of you, I was looking to really make an impact um, in the communities that meant the most to me. I wanted to serve children that look like me and all of you. And so I uh, went to NYU undergrad. And during my time at NYU, I have to say, and I think this will probably resonate with a lot of your students, I, I sought out mentors. I sought out folks that could really help me thrive. And as a result of that, I had the, the honor of joining an in, the Inroads program. For those of you unfamiliar, um, it was a program geared towards um, students of color that had potential. And the great majority of the students that were accepted through this internship program were for the most part looking to go into the corporate sector. I wasn't quite sure where I was headed. Um, where I grew up in Washington Heights, I had um, a number of my peers that did not have the same opportunity that were afforded me. Um, I grew up in a very under-resourced community in Washington Heights, both my mother and father, uh, 21 years of age. They themselves had not gone to college, but they certainly wanted more from my brother and I. So they worked they worked multiple jobs um, so that we could attend a private school, which really um, in essence, gave us a leg up. I, I don't know that I would have had the opportunities today had I not had that foundation. Um, second grade found out that I had ADHD. And because we had phenomenal teachers in our school that were really invested in in my growth and my, my potential, they worked really hard. So fast forward, I'm at NYU. 
I'm part of the inroads program. I'm in an internship at MetLife and really just trying to, you know, pave my way. Graduation comes around and I decide that I will not be taking the opportunity that was um, that was given to me through MetLife. After four years of interning, they had offered me a position in their MAP program. So now I'm going to date myself. It was a management assist, um, assistance program where you would be in a manager level position and then be able you know, to move up in the ranks, if you will. But instead, I took a position with an organization called Aspida of New York. And it enabled me to help first generation students of color um, go on to higher education. I too uh, was first generation college graduate in my family and it just brought me so much joy. I, I really found my purpose when I started working at Aspida and then I spent the last 25 years um, in the nonprofit sector leading a number of different organizations, whether it was college access or success, uh, financial literacy. Uh, I, I did it all just in an effort from my perspective to, to even the playing field. I wanted the same opportunity that were afforded me um, to be afforded to, to students like, like us. And um, my first opportunity to really serve at the helm of a nonprofit was when I was 31 years old and I was tapped to be the CEO at Literacy Inc. Um, it was an amazing experience. I learned a great deal. Happy to share a little bit about that later on in the conversation. But what I will say is that that, that put me in a position to continue to move in my career trajectory and continue to take on um, senior leadership positions throughout the nonprofit sector, which ultimately um, led me to Pencils of Promise. And it was, uh, as you had alluded to, Danielle, my, my first opportunity to really serve on an international platform. The great majority of my career has been domestic education. And so I was really excited to marry all that I had done thus far and be able to serve three countries, uh, which in, we were serving Ghana and Africa, um, Laos in Southeast Asia and Central America, Guatemala. And during my three years at Pencils of Promise, we built 500 schools, uh, serve over 100,000 students and just uh, we're in the business of ensuring that where a child begins is not necess necessarily dictates where they end up and every child deserves um, access to a quality education and that has certainly been my mantra. Amazing. I was like, I know how to pick my friends. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at the questions that I had set aside, um, and I, I think it's great for us to celebrate our victories, but I think it's also important for us, you know, what advice would you have given yourself at, let's say, 25 um, that you wish, that you think would have made a difference for you personally, and maybe even professionally, too? Yeah. Okay. So, so let me say this, right? I think one of the challenges I see for high flying black and brown girls is there's like a, 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 a kind of momentum and celebration of everything that you do that comes from uh, performing at the level that we've all performed at. And I have to say when I first was in, it's not that I wasn't aware of racism and sexism. That just wasn't, part of my calculus in terms of how I was trying to navigate the world. So I think the first time I confronted something at work that felt um, a little different, let's say, um, I did not feel prepared. Um, and looking back, I don't know, would I have taken the risks that I had taken if someone had, you know, given me the 411? Um, or, you know, were there opportunities or, and are there opportunities now when we're talking to younger women who are coming to all of us um, to really help people go into spaces with their eyes open, if that makes sense? Yeah. I, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Tanya. No, 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 you go first and then I'll go. I was going to say to your first question, um, I would tell my 25 year old self to really take more risks. 
I was so busy focusing on stabilizing myself. Growing up, it was not as stable. And so I was like going to be, you know, lack of a better word, a Claire Huxtable. And I was going to have my ducks in a row. I think I would have actually been more risky or take more opportunities. Maybe I would have traveled across the country, not be so focused of, you know, I'm just in New York and I'll stay in New York. Maybe I would have taken a, a, a opportunity abroad. All these things that I said, wow, I look back on it now. And I said to my 25 year old self, I would have taken more risks, more opportunities and not look like, well, I just have to focus on this. I can do this can focus on getting my law degree, but I can also focus on maybe traveling, taking an opportunity, uh, you know, across the country or around the world. So I can have seen the world in that space more than just taking vacations. So I would say that to my 25 year old self. Tanya. Yes. For me, I, I, and I, I want to kind of piggyback off what she just said. I, I would have been a little bit more adventurous. I certainly did not think I had the luxury of being adventurous. Um, so to give you perspective, you know, I'm in NYU, the great majority of my peers are white, right? I didn't have a lot of um, fellow students in my class that were folks of color. And many of them traveled and many of them took an opportunity to go abroad or they just took the moment to smell the roses. And yet I, I just didn't have that luxury, right? I was working 30 hours a week um, every day throughout my four years in undergrad. And while I know that enabled me to finance my education and then ultimately achieve other goals that I had set for myself, I, I really would have liked to have enjoyed undergrad a bit more. And I just, I worked and I worked. And I know that for many of the students that I mentored when I was in Aspira, I told them to find a way to strike a balance. Like I, we, I recognize that for many of them like me, uh, they grew up under-resourced or they grew up in poverty, but if there were opportunities to be a little bit more adventurous, to really enjoy those four years in undergrad while still you know, working hard, playing hard, I, I would encourage that. I, I wanna encourage my 11 year old to eventually do that because I, I certainly missed out. Rose? You're muted. I'm in complete agreement with um, Deborah and Tanya in terms of what um, um, they both just shared. I would say um, to my 25 year old self is one understanding the power of mentorship and and having that person uh, beyond family members, your parents, obviously, and also the power of networking. Um, and I think um, for someone like myself, um, understanding that you need to be the CEO of you. I realized that later on in life, but had I understood that at 25, there's some decisions I probably would have made. I certainly would have been networking. I think there's a perception of, you know, when people meet you, um, they think you have a big personality in terms of your public persona, but anybody who really knows me knows I'm kind of an introvert. So um, if I'm at a at an event, for example, that would be a networking that I'll be in the corner, right? Afraid at the age of 25 to do that. And I wish I was more aggressive about that and certainly um, bolder, but understanding that I am the CEO of Rose Pierre Louis Inc. I think I wish I was more intentional, uh, was um, fully understood the credentials that I brought to the table um, and um, uh, uh, could, to your point, Danielle, you know, when you encountered those moments, um, I, I, the person now, if that would happen to me now, that person would feel very badly when I got done with them. But at 25, um, I, I think of moments like, I, I think I was 23 when I became a lawyer and um, you know, you, you're, you get your little outfit together and you're going, you're going to court and the court officer says to me, when they call the case, where's your attorney? I was like, I am the attorney. 
right? There, there are these, these microaggressions, which we understand so clearly now, but back then, you're like, ugh, but I wish I had, um, was uh, self-possessed to be able to make that more of a teachable moment. Um, and I still struggle with networking and, and uh, keeping in mind that I am the CEO of Rose Pierre Louis and I've got to invest in myself, my rela uh, relationships as I do for the organizations and the people I've worked for. How do you think your understanding of how race and gender have impacted your career has changed? Um, over time? I'm happy to start with. Um, I think as a woman of color, um, I graduated law school in, in 1989. So a, a very different time to Deborah's point. Um, uh, even though we knew a lot of black attorneys, but many of the spaces that we worked with, we were the only ones um, and um, I know that I was constantly underestimated, not because I gave a, a reason for that um, conclusion, it was because of this. And that it's not even being about two to three times better. You are constantly also trying to show that you belong at the table. And so um, I, I now have evolved to a place where um, I'm less concerned. Um, when I encounter those moments now when someone is underestimating me or devaluing me, I create an opportunity for them to clearly understand what I bring to the table. Um, and I also, um, it has really been important for me to draw upon women like Danielle, who I've had many a meal with, uh, talking about uh, some of the challenges and forming those networks of brotherhood and sisterhood to get um, some pointers, ideas on how to best handle. Um, but I think those challenges still exist um, and that it is through conversations like this, it is through breaking barriers, um, also understanding that we can help break those barriers by when you get those calls from those headhunters and they're like, um, why are you bothering me on LinkedIn? As opposed to say, who do I know in my network that is a person of color that I can call the recruiter and say, thanks for thinking of me, but um, I have a great candidate to recommend. So I understand that I am also a link in the chain and that I can be one of my um, favorite sayings is from Gandhi, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And that's what I try to do every day. Um, Deborah, do you want to talk about how, you know, your views of how race and gender have affected your career have evolved over time? Um, I, I can speak to when I look back at some things in my life and I said, oh, I didn't realize that I was being discriminated by my, you know, and I always will say race first and then my gender because I, I show up as a black woman. So and I look back at opportunities and, and, and things and say, wow, that, that was definitely not how people um, should have viewed me. And I think of one particular instance where, and I'll go way back to high school. I remember saying that I wanted to be a lawyer. Again, I had that in my mind, um, you know, Claire Huxtable, this is the mid eighties. And, and I remember uh, the counselor saying, um, I think you should, go to, you know, maybe go to beauty school and do hair. Now, if anyone that knows me knows I don't do anyone's hair or could do anyone's hair. But in that mind, um, that is what she had thought that that would be the best for me and didn't really support me, even though I had shared about what was going on in my life at home. 
um, didn't really prepare me at all for college. I, I actually, and I've shared this recently with folks, I was sort of, um, I wouldn't say the word push, but I was definitely directed to go to a community college, not having to take in the SATs. And then when I get to the college, the community college, one of the professors who actually was visiting from Columbia and was teaching a class uh, for a semester for a friend said, what are you doing here? You belong at a four year. Um, so there, right there, as I look back and I go, wow, you know, but I am a big believer that you are where you're supposed to be in life, even when there's, um, you know, even when there is those challenges. And so I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. But when I look back, I feel like the racism for me has been probably more prevalent in my life than my gender. Um, I, I, and that's just how I feel as myself today, as someone who's aware and older and has lived a, a, a long time, um, I, I try very hard. And I think, um, I think Rose had said earlier about the microaggressions. I'm always looking for opportunity to seek clarity. You know, my younger self would have been like, what are you saying? Like, no, it's like, can you talk a little bit about, can you unpack that? I, I didn't get that. So there's a little bit more of that um, because we understand that uh, folks are coming from all different backgrounds and may not understand or uh, who I am when I show up, right? I show up as a black woman who's middle-aged, who has a lived experience. And that can be sometimes, um, you know, a, a little troubling for people. But for me, it's always been about, you know, my race and who I am as a black woman that might have played into all of the challenges I had more so than my gender. Tanya? I would, um, for me, I would say race probably played a far larger role than gender. While gender certainly played a role from time to time, I found it, I found race to be more prevalent. When I think back, I wish that I would have spoken up more. Uh, and, and Danielle, you've known me for so many years. I'm not shy, and I certainly know how to um, advocate for myself. But I will admittedly share that in my professional life, early on in my 20s, when there were microaggressions or commentary that I knew was inappropriate, and I most certainly should have called folks out on it, I chose not to. And I think in those moments, I... I rationalized or I reconciled that I was lucky to be there. But over time with maturity and experience and age, I recognized that I, I belong there. And there should not have been any level of imposter syndrome or me trying to rationalize it. So when folks share with me, wow, you're really articulate. I knew in that moment that was not a compliment. And yet I, I allowed it, right? I, I didn't correct folks when they made those commentary or um, I have naturally curly hair and I was advised early on in my career um, by a, a, a white manager of mine when I was in MetLife to wear my hair straight more often that folks would take me more seriously as opposed to my natural curls. And I will admittedly share that that stuck with me for far longer than it should have. So that meant if there was an important event or a meeting or an interview, I was blowing out my hair because God forbid, I show up in my natural curls, right? And not be taken seriously or um, have to explain why I was there. And so those are the things that when I look back, I wish I would have been more vocal because I know I had it in me, but at that moment, I still felt really young in my career and I didn't want to rock the boat, right? I felt as if I was very lucky that I had moved so quickly in my career trajectory and that so many folks were investing in my, in my leadership. I didn't want to come across as that brown girl that was, you know, rocking the boat. And so now nothing holds me back, right? Like I am someone that advocates for myself, advocates for others. And so I would certainly recommend to all the students listening that, you know, you have a voice. And I think now more than ever, we recognize we can't sit back and tolerate microaggressions 
or have to contend with imposter syndrome. We belong there. I, when I was also applying to NYU, I recall my guidance counselor telling me, well, you better make sure you have a number of other backup schools. Um, I had applied to NYU at the time, Columbia and a number of others. And despite what I believe were fairly good grades, I was an A student, yet she wasn't encouraging me um, to apply to any of the Ivy League. She wasn't encouraging me to apply to a great number of the four-year colleges. And so I'm glad that I didn't listen <laughs> and I still uh, apply to the school that I thought I could be a contender for. And so I think that you know a big lesson for me there as well was realizing that you are your biggest advocate. And you, you yourself have to advocate for yourself. And while I may not have been verbalizing it along the way, I most certainly was acting upon it. Um, so Rose, you, you talked about something that I would love for us to dig into a little bit more. And that was about, um, you know, your personal brand and, you know, being Rose Pierre-Louis Inc. Um, and I, that totally resonates with me, you know, because after 25, 30 years in this sector myself, you know, I realize that I've built multiple organizations and brands, but I don't own anything. Like, and so, you know, these organizations benefit from our ingenuity and our innovative approaches and our creativity and our intellectual and social capital at this point, right? I've been around long enough. Um, that I bring all of that to the table. Um, and, uh, you know, so so how have you built that brand? Um, because I think that, you know, one of, one of the things that really shocked me when I realized that maybe I do have a brand is when I got the call to do a TED Talk. Um, you know, I hadn't applied. It wasn't on my radar or my bucket list. I don't know why. Probably like imposter syndrome, right? I didn't see myself as being one of those. And I remember in that moment feeling, but I'm not a CEO right now um, because I had taken a, a different kind of C-suite role. And they were like, oh, we weren't paying attention to where you work. Um, it's really about, you know, these ideas that you've shared in, in, in multiple platforms. Um, and so that's when I first started to lean into this idea. Well, what does Danielle Moss Inc. mean and look like? And how do you build a brand um, outside of a specific organization as you're developing a career? It's a great question. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the currency that you develop through the organizations that you've led and the programs that you've developed that have been transformational, to me, your currency uh, as a CEO of uh, Danielle Moss, Inc., is your reputation, your record of achievements, um, how you have had to expand the footprint of an organization or to, to gain more visibility. So for me, that has been a way um, that I, I find that now I, uh, you know, not when I'm writing my resume do I try to think of my, of my accomplishments. I try to take inventory of those accomplishments on a regular basis or as they're happening because you know sometimes you will forget those things i couple that also with um, um understanding that um as a result of these leadership positions that you've had that you have the opportunity to offer your thought leadership and I've always shied away from doing that. And I think that over the last, quite honestly, couple of years, I've been more intentional about it. So for me, you know, I've worked for, um, I've been a COO. So what we haven't talked about is being a number two. Um, and I've been a number one and I've been a number two. And I'm very good at being a two. And um, there's something that I've known to, to have impact. So I think I've developed a reputation of that, people knowing that I can be the number one. But when you bring some, you know, if you bring someone like me into the organization, you know you're going to get these kinds of um, these kinds of impacts. So I'm trying to talk more in forums like this, which typically I would not do it because think about it. 
if you have someone who's your CEO or president, a lot of your work is about investing in their thought leadership and getting them out there. So I'm, I'm trying to dip my toe and uh, into the waters of uh, uh, continuing to build my brand and my currency and um, thought leadership um, by um, speaking more, being part of organizations. Um, you know, I've founded two organizations that I think have had tremendous impact. The Haitian Roundtable, uh, which we founded 13 years ago, and the Frederick Douglass Boulevard Alliance. Um, and so I, I, I've become much more selective about the organizations I'm involved in. And um, um, I think that combined continues to help grow um, uh, RPL Inc. And what I would say also is having a kitchen cabinet for me has been the most transformational thing to, to help me continue to, to be able to articulate my value and, and how that is shared in public spaces and professional spaces. Yeah, I think I think the kitchen cabinet is so important. Um, Deborah, can you can you elaborate a little bit on this this idea and also talk about your own kitchen cabinet? <laughs> well, you know, um, I agree with everything Rose says. I have been a very strong number two for a very long time. I have supported so many leaders, and I have been instrumental in executing on their deliverables and what they want. And it's been wonderful to be able to take that and own that. But I realized um, maybe about two or three years ago, it was time for me to step into that um, senior role and that, that sort of CEO role. And it was very scary because when you're number two, you can always say it's number one. But when you're number one, it's like, it's on you. And I have to say it's been, um, life-changing for me because I didn't think I'd be prepared. I thought I had to get to a certain level to get to this. And I didn't realize that for being number two for so long, for years, decades, was preparing me to be number one. And so I would say that that has been life-changing for me because I think sometimes people want to get to number one and they're saying, well, I need this and I need that. But if you've been a strong number two or a strong number three, right? and you're focused and you're trying to get that person to be successful or that particular entity or whatever it is, you possibly can go into the number one space um, sooner than you thought. My kitchen cabinet, I've got everybody. Um, I will tell you, I've been extremely blessed. I would not be where I am with my mentors and sponsors. It just, and, and people I can go to, um, they're managing partners, they're general counsels, they're politicians. They are um, everyone that has wanted to invest in Deborah. They can be, I'll say, even folks who you might not even think about it, whether it be like someone who is probably being an assistant for like, you know, 30 years who've spoken to my life and made sure that I was positioned for certain opportunities. Um, I have been incredibly blessed to have this group of men and women who've said, you know, we've taken an interest in Deborah and we are going to make sure she is positioned for these roles. I remember even coming to Sidley and people were so happy for me. Other law firms who were like, wow, I wish you would have came to us, but we're so happy that you went to uh, this major law firm to do this work. Um, and I thought that was kind, right? Isn't that wonderful where you have competitors saying, I wanna still see you shine and what can I do to make you su successful there even though I would have loved to have you here. That goes back to building what you were saying, building your brand. Your reputation is everything. Your reputation is everything. People need to know, like I always say that when people say my name, I want them to say Deborah Martin Owens with a smile, right? Not like, oh, I don't know. You want that, per you want, to be known as a person that is someone that is generous with their time, generous with their information. I think something that um, I think it was, um, uh, I don't know, it was a Tanya Rose who said, you know, if there's an opportunity that I can't um, accept, I got to think about someone else. Hey, I, 
I, I'm not this person, you know, I, I can't do this uh, role, the speaking role, whatever it is, but I know someone that would be great. You should be generous with your time, generous with, with all the resources you have. There is not a day that goes by I'm not emailing my group of 700 black women across this country, letting them know about a program, an event or whatever it is. I am that person because I feel like to me, I did not get here. Remember I said earlier, my parents did not have a high school education and I'm a lawyer at a major law firm, um, not practicing law, but I am an attorney at a major firm doing diversity. That means something in this world, right? And that means somebody helped me because it wasn't them. So for me, it's all about the reputation that you bring, the value you bring and how hard you're willing to work when it's not always you, when it's someone else. That's a big key. When it's someone else and you're putting that value into someone else, you know, you get to see uh, your 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 star shine when it's the time to shine. So that's what I would say. Tanya, you want to tell us about Brand Tanya? Brand Tanya, <laughs> I I mean, listen, I agree wholeheartedly with both Deborah and Rose. Um, we have a personal brand, and your reputation precedes you. And very similar to what Deborah said a moment ago, when I when someone says Tanya Ramos, I want them to say it with a smile. I want them to be able to think back to some really powerful moments or a moment that I helped them thrive or a moment where we shared a laugh or I played a supporting role. I feel extremely blessed by the kitchen cabinet I have. I have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I have every spice in my cabinet. And Danielle, you know you're one of them. And now I can add Deborah and Rose to my cabinet. Um, we we didn't get here alone, right? We we all have amazing potential, and we have seen that potential through. And we've made some major, we've had major accomplishments, things that we're proud of. But I guess what I'm probably most proud of are the folks that I've helped along the way, because that's where I get my biggest satisfaction by ensuring that folks that look like you and I are getting ahead and thinking about how I can continue to mentor um, and to support. And then relative to my brand, you know, Danielle, what you said a little while ago resonated with me. I, I've spent the last 26 years of my career building other organizations, building boards, um, raising millions of dollars to support missions that that truly meant a great deal to me. Um, and yet I didn't put that same energy into my brand, into who I am, what my, you know, my legacy was tied into what I've done for others. And I want to make sure that it's equally tied into what I'm also doing um, for myself. And so I will say that in the last three years that I served as um, CEO at POP, I found a balance. I found an opportunity to, you know, again, be the external spokesperson for the organization that I was serving while simultaneously building my brand and, and, and ensuring that I had a voice at the table. And so I've participated in a number of panels like this one. Um, I've done a number of Facebook Lives, um, podcasts, really recognizing that, that I have a story to tell and that if my story help someone else overcome an obstacle or shed light on a struggle that someone is encountering or if there's something that i say that provides a level of advice or insight into their career journey i want to be able to do just that and so i am now so committed to continuing to do that and to continuing to lend my voice to to the matters that mean the most to me but while simultaneously being able to elevate my own voice So amazing. Um, love seeing the comments in the in the chat. If you have questions for the panel, please um, start to type them now because um, we're coming up on time. Um, I, I can't have this conversation not, and not spend a little bit of time talking about haters because um, we've talked about the people who support us and buoy us up and um, help oh, us to be way out of no way. But folks have to understand that none of this comes uh, without some cost. Um, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, I, th I think because of how individualistic our society is, it's hard for people to like focus on their lane and not look and see what everybody else has on their plate. Um, you know, focus on you. 
Um, but some people don't, and they will come for you. Um, and sometimes they will use their power to um, really kind of knock you down a peg. And I think there's a certain level of it that comes when you are a black woman. And, you know, I've definitely been called uppity by supervisors. Um, and I've had people say, oh, you have, you know, West, Indi West Indian uh, ancestry. That explains why, you know, you don't take direction the way I think you should. And, and just kind of like heaping all of their I don't believe in microaggressions because I think they are meant to injure and they do cause harm. Um, and so it, it never feels micro for me, at least in the moment. Um, but how do you handle the fact that everyone isn't going to love you? Um, everybody is not rooting for you. Everybody doesn't have your back. Um, so how do you handle your haters? I'm, I'm happy to start. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of haters along the way. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I think back to my abuelita, my grandmother, who would always say, Tanya, not everyone's going to like you, but you make sure they respect you. And I have kept that um, in my mind throughout my career. And so I try to operate from a, pl a, a blend of, you know, gratitude and um, vulnerability and empathy. And that's the way I show up in the world. And if people don't like how I show up, that's okay. But I've learned with age, right? Because early on in my career, when I encountered a hater, um, you know, I, 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 I tackled it head on. And so of course I was pegged as being aggressive or, you know, Tanya, you can't say everything on your mind, you know, yes, you can be a straight shooter, but I don't know about that. I don't know how that's going to enable you to thrive in your career. Um, because I, I was comfortable with Matthew. Like I had no qualm with approaching you if I thought you were hating on me and trying to sabotage or be manipulative. And I would call you out on your shit, oh, on your stuff, right? <laughs> and, um, but I, I learned with time that that's part of the program. It's unfortunate. It's, um, I guess, a necessary evil, right? As you move up in your career trajectory, and particularly as a woman and a woman of color, you're not expected to thrive. You're not expected to be as successful. You're not expected to be as articulate. And so you're going to have haters and you just have to manage it, right? You have to continue showing up in your authentic way and folks will hate. Don't allow it to hinder you from moving forward. Don't allow it to get in the way of your purpose, your mission, how you're progressing in life, how you're showing up daily. Um, so I've just learned to deal, right? To recognize that that will come, but as long as I am being true to myself and I am living a life of purpose, folks can keep hating from afar. I'm going to keep on moving. I love it. Um, Deborah Rose, you want to add anything to that? You're, you're muted, Rose. Um, so the one thing I will say is when people talk about leadership, leadership is not this straight line, right? Leadership has peaks and valleys. Um, and um, I, I always say that that makes you a stronger leader. And I think uh, I can speak for myself um, that when you are someone that understands what you bring to the table, you set standards and set expectations, which is exactly what your white male counterparts do, you are perceived completely differently. And that may have consequences. And um, you may be perceived as too aggressive, or if you're direct, it could be also attributed to whatever background they, they ascribe to you. Um, I find that in those moments, I draw upon my, my, my networks, my kitchen cabinet that is always going to have my back. It's going to ride with me no matter what and, and work with me as I um, navigate the haters because the, the, the haters can be deadly. And without that kind of support, um, it can leave irreparable damage. And I believe 
continue to, this is an adage from my Haitian dad, Dr. Pierre Louis, continue to overwhelm them with your qualifications and never apologize for being who you are and the type of leader that you are. So I just put my head down and get to the grind. And then I know through my own will and the people that I know that are supportive of me that whatever valley that I have encountered, there's a peak that's waiting with my name on it. Mm, um, I, I, that was a word. Deborah? That was a word. Um, I wish I could be so eloquent. <laughs> You know, I, I realize and I struggle with this even all these years later when I feel like, why isn't everyone rooting for me when I, it's not really even about me. I'm, I'm pushing an agenda that's going to help people or I'm focused on things. And what I have found is that um, people are really scared when they see um, someone that has a vision. When you're a visionary, um, it is something that people may, may not um, understand because visionaries are over here. They're not like in your face. And so for me, um, when I have had those issues, um, I try to remember that they're coming from a place of where they're scared. They're wondering, you know, I'm sitting next to a pace setter. I'm sitting next to someone that, you know, is clearly, you know, light years ahead in what I'm doing. And I don't know what to do. And instead of sort of leaning in and saying, "Hey, how can you know what? How did you do that or or learn that?" Um, they become scared, and of and of course do things like sabotage and undermine. I mean, I try to remember that. I've had some recent experiences with that, and I try to say, you know, as I look back, that's more about the person's um, shortcomings than my own. Um, it's more about the fact that um, the only person that I ever really compete with, um, Deborah Martin Owens, is Deborah Martin Owens. There's this Deborah Martin Owens that lives out in the world, and that person is the person I'm trying to meet. She's, you know, extremely knowledgeable. She's an expert. She's this, all that, and I'm trying to get to her level. And so that's the only person I've ever competed with. It's never been anyone that existed. But for some people, it is very difficult. So I try to remember the grace and mercy and say, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, try to focus on the fact that they are maybe living in a space where they see someone who is a visionary and, and they are struck by it and really don't know what to do. So I would say that. Um, and also to making sure your kitchen cabinet, you're sort of checking things because sometimes as, as black women, as women of color, as, as leaders, um, we have to also make sure that we're checking in and saying, you know, is this, is this, what do you think of this? Is this really what I think it is? Because sometimes it could be sabotage or whatever, and other times it could be something for you to think about and grow from. Um, but I, I will say that we should not take on other people's um, challenges and what they're going through your only competitor should be yourself. I, I thought it was important to have that conversation because I don't want the Oliver Scholars or the other people um, watching this recording to kind of like, oh, look, everything is always rosy. Oh, no. Every time you move into a space, people are gonna celebrate you and every win means a promotion and every, yeah. you know, every accomplishment means a raise. You know, yeah. I, I have definitely, i um, been in situations where I've had people say, oh, that, you know, that's a lot of money for you when it came to conversations yeah. um, around compensation. I've been in positions where I've gone years, I've been expected to go years without any kind of increase in compensation. Hello. I to find a, a way to kind of advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that looks you know, like people, know. you know, not sharing information. Um, oh, yeah keeping information away from you so that you oh, can yeah, right, act on it right, accordingly. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes <laughs> people will see you in the news and think that's a great thing. And for other people, it can signal something else. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're giving something your whole self, um, it's really kind of hard to imagine and insulate yourself 
from those um, instances when people don't have your back. Um, that's what that's why I have to say, you know, I don't get to see all of you ladies on a regular basis, but every time we see each other, like if we went out for, for a drink tomorrow, yeah. it would be like no time had passed um, yeah, because agreed. we have shared this journey and being visible to each other and validating each other has been really what has gotten me through some of um, the valleys um, because you are never, you never graduate from race and gender, right? Yeah. So- no. No, you know, I think about um, even Oprah a couple of years ago when she took a job with 60 Minutes. Does anybody remember this? Yes. It was like so amazing, right? Oprah is going to bring her magic to 60 Minutes. And it didn't last more than a season. Why? Because you had producers at 60 Minutes telling Oprah how to report, how to interview people, how to engage with guests. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. Excuse me? So I, I watched all 25 years of her show, so she doesn't need to be told. Okay. I tell you this, that when just, you get attacked like, thank like you that, for even considering this role and let her do her thing. Yeah, when um, you, it when is you're, so hard. When you're attacked like that relentlessly, I want you to know, and anyone that's under the sound of my voice, I want you to know that that's a good thing. Nobody spends time attacking someone like that relentlessly, your haters or whatever, if they don't feel the fear of God coming at you. So to me, don't feel that way. When I have folks coming at me and undermining me, I'm like, oh, I'm, I must be a threat out here in these streets. So it's okay, you know. And that's, <laughs> that's what I would say. And it, it, if it's relentless, it's like, oh, they see something, and sometimes they see things that you don't see about yourself, right? That's a that's a but thing. You'll, I you'll be sitting there like little old me, little old me. You're coming for all, me? all of this for little oh, old yes. me. They're coming for you because they see your star. So yeah. you have to remember that. So you, you have, have to, to be that. relentless. And you have to seek out support. And, you know, some of the people that I've mentored just hit me up on LinkedIn or or even on Instagram. Like, they're not people who had a personal relationship with me. I will always take that call. You know, th the biggest conflict I had with an assistant of mine was someone who felt like I was too important to speak to some people. And I said, that's not how I operate. You don't know where people are going to end up. You don't know the impact of any seed that you're going to sow. So yeah, I do th feel like that's part of my personal mission to make myself available, not as an expert really, but to share my experiences, to share my insights um, and to give an encouraging word um, to people who are really kind of uh, in this moment of DEI or reckoning, really trying to find their space in various organizations. Um, so I think one Daniel, of the questions- Daniel, can I, oh, I wanted to just say one thing just, to kind of piggyback off of what everyone's saying. I also wanted to share and, and be vulnerable in this moment. I was going through a challenging time professionally and Danielle, you know that I recently gave you a call um, and I leaned in. And the one thing that touched my being was when Danielle said, Tanya, why did you wait so long to share? I would have been here, I would have been here to support you. And I generally lean in, but there are those moments folks where when, when you have haters or you have folks that are sabotaging you or folks that are coming for you, you may retreat. I generally don't, but I will admittedly share in a place of vulnerability that I retreated. And that was the worst mistake I could have made because I have so many amazing folks in my ecosystem and Danielle's one of them. And I wish I would have leaned in more in that moment because another thing that Danielle shared with me when we did have that conversation with like, Tanya, there's so many of us that are going through that. I, if you would have come to me sooner, I probably could have helped you carry that load. And so I, I, I just appeal to everyone listening that there are times that the load is really, really heavy. And I have been taught, and this is very much a part of my upbringing, to be tough, to be strong, to be resilient um, in order to get ahead. And a lot of that stays with me. And I've had to unlearn some of that and recognize there is so much power in being vulnerable and being able to lean in um, in those moments. And it doesn't matter where you are in your journey or where you are or where you sit in your career trajectory. We all need to oftentimes lean in in our most vulnerable moments. And so that was a real learning moment for me. Um, and so I, I would really encourage folks that 
this stuff isn't easy and we don't have to do it alone. Y'all know I'm not a believer in doing anything alone. Because the, the other the other piece of this is when you find a way to be transparent when things aren't going well, then people know the level of support and help that you need. Um, if you're always wearing the mask that grins and lies, right? Um, then people are like, oh, she got this. She's going forward. Like she doesn't need any support or help. Um, and so, and, and what we have to remember is that other people are where they are because they are asking for and accepting help too. So whether it's like, you know, helping someone prep for an interview or, um, you know, someone doesn't get a job. I've had a couple of people maybe in my career reach out to me and say, you know, I, th I thought we had a great interview. Would you be willing to have a conversation about, you know, why I wasn't selected? Um, and I've been willing to have those conversations and leave people with a sense of possibility and their dignity intact um, and been very transparent. Um, and the other thing about the brand that I just want to name is that the world is like seriously small. Um, and I'll just tell the audience that in the 15 minutes before this call started, we were making all kinds of connections in terms of like, oh, Deborah knows my cousin and, you know, Rose knows someone who knows Deborah. And that's kind of how a lot of sectors are. If you're a black or brown attorney, you're going to find that somebody knows somebody who knows you. Right. Um, and that's certainly the case in the nonprofit sector. Right. And I don't use that as a weapon. Um, you know, I've, I've had staff say, oh, I, I want to go to a new job and, you know, I don't want you to talk ill of me. Um, you know, I never give bad references. That's just not um, how I operate in the world, because I think no matter what the circumstances are, everybody deserves to eat. Um, but be mindful of how you show up in spaces. Um, you know, be mindful of how you treat people. Um, you know, some people might say, oh, she, you know, she's I've hired the same people at multiple organizations in some instances. And, you know, when I've been questioned about that, my response is, I know a lot of people who would never want to work for their last boss again. So doesn't that say something about my leadership and how I engage with my teams that people would see me taking on new challenges and want to be a part of that? Um, you know, so always trying to figure out a way to, to kind of spin it uh, so that it kind of reflects your true um, self um, in, in those spaces, because people are always looking for, for holes and, and opportunities. Um, I feel like sometimes I've been put in situations where the boat is broken. You know, the boat, boat has holes. You know, there are no life jackets on the boat. You want me to fix all the problems. Um, and then you're going to keep throwing water as I'm bailing it out while I'm trying to fix the situation. Um, so you just have to be really savvy. Look for those mentors who are encouragers. Look for sponsors who are decision makers. And certainly, I think someone touched on this earlier, you know, everyone who's been in, in, in my inner circle, in my, um, you know, kitchen cabinet has not been a person of color. They're not always women of color. I like to say, you know, some of my white male mentors um, who were un uninhibited by the, the, the constraints of race and gender have seen things that were possible for me that I just couldn't see because of my own experiences. Um, and the other thing I would say um, that, that I don't wanna lose this is workplace trauma is real. Get you some therapy, get you an executive coach, get you some friends. Don't let a job fundamentally change who you are and how you show up in, in the world um, because there's more to life than, than work. We all have all kinds of hidden talents and interests that we deserve um, the space, the mental space to be able to explore um, the fullness of our lives. Um, there is one question. I'm going to end with this question. What is your advice to the upcoming student scholars who aspire for roles normally occupied by people who don't look like them? I would say don't worry about that. You know, if there's an opportunity that you want to aspire to or go after, do not worry about who's not been there before you. Um, I would focus on the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, we still are doing a lot of firsts, you know, in this country. And so looking at to see who's there already not is not going to happen. 
Um, I've taken on roles where I was the only person of color. You know, I was representing everybody um, just by my presence. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen for some of us. We're not going to be entering spaces where there's a bunch of us there. So we have to be comfortable going to spaces that we want to occupy um, and maybe perhaps being the first. I, I agree. Um, my advice is don't allow that um, to stop you from pursuing an opportunity. Throughout my career, I've always been one of the only, right? Every leadership team I've been a part of, I've oftentimes been the only person of color on that team. So I would encourage all of you, if you're looking for a role where you recognize there may not be a lot of diversity, um, then try to bring diversity along once you get there. I would never um, make that be an inhibitor for you pursuing that role. I would also say to kind of piggyback off of what Danielle said a moment ago, um, you know, there's real trauma, there's real issues that that we will contend with, you know, race, gender, the, a lot of those issues are not going away. And so if you find that you're going to be in a role where there's not going to be a lot of you there, or a lot of support in that way, then seek it out. That's where you leverage your kitchen cabinet. That's where you leverage your personal ecosystem um, to, to garner support. Um, but that should never stop you from pursuing any opportunity. And, you know, and I would say if you're an Oliver Scholar in particular, you not only have an amazing staff, but you have a tribe of 1,200 alumni who are doing Agreed. the thing in all yeah. kinds of fields. We got doctors, we got nonprofit CEOs. There is no reason for anyone that's affiliated with the Oliver program to be going at anything alone. So Agreed. just have to give that plug. Rose, did you want to say something? Um. One thing that I would say, which was not available during my time, is LinkedIn. Um, and I don't think people really understand what a tremendous resource LinkedIn is. So Amen. if you are applying for a job that, you know, there's a possibility of you being a first, do some research and try to find other people who are serving in those roles that may look like you. The other thing that I would say, and there's this uh, great book written um, by my link sister and sorority sister uh, as part of a, a trio of authors, is The Little Black Book of Success. Shout uh, out to Rhonda. Rhonda Joy McLean. Uh, um, and there was a whole chapter about white, men, white male mentors and allyship. And I think it's very, very important as we talk about um, kitchen cabinets to think about who are the people that are a part of that. And I could say for myself, even when I became a deputy borough president, I, I'm thankful that Scott saw something in me that at the time that I didn't even realize that I could be that, right? And he has been an ally for me in ways that no one can even no one can even uh, compare to to the kinds of support and doors and investment that are happening. So understand that LinkedIn. Maybe I don't know if you've done a workshop on LinkedIn. I, I still try to navigate and be as intentional with LinkedIn as I am with Twitter and IG. Um, but uh, it is a tremendous resource, and I think your your alumni is incredible. And um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be ashamed. Understand that is part of the growth process and the development of your brand and your leadership. And understand in doing so, it is all of our responsibilities to reach back and when you are the first, understand that empowerment is not about the seat that you sit in. It is about the person following you that will occupy that seat. Thank you so much. That's such a powerful word to end our conversation on. Um, thanks to everybody who joined us on Facebook and YouTube. Um, thank you to our remarkable producer extraordinaire extraordinaire Moshe Crone, who is our Director of Marketing and Communications at Oliver Scholars. Um, glad to see some of the alumni tuning in. 
And um, happy Women's History Month, ladies. This was amazing. And um, I just can't wait for the world to open up because I'm going to track all of you down and we're, <laughs> we're going to see each other in person. Hopefully. Hopefully 2021 will be it. Yes. I'm ready. I'm oh, ready. So. I'm ready. Yes, we're all ready. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Danielle. Everyone. Thanks, Danielle.